<laughs> Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for uh, your spirit who is at work uh, in us individually and in us as a as a body. And I'm so thankful that um, that our, our plans are not uh, up to us. Uh, we submit our plans to you, and you are the uh, Lord of all and have a plan. Uh, for all things, we're so thankful that we can rest in that assurance of your control, in your love, and in your goodness. Thank you for all that's taken place here this morning. Lord, as we um, listen to your word, um, just pray that your spirit will continue to speak uh, your word to us as we go forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Last, last week, John uh, talked to, in his message about hitching a message to my series of messages on humanity and he said a few things that are like oh I want to hitch one more on to what he's already uh, tagged on to and so um, I'm not great with titles but freedom and obedience are kind of the themes that I was uh, thinking about having listened to John and, and been thinking about some of the things that we worked through in the past where we've talked about you know being made in the image of this Trinitarian God which is why when John talked about loneliness uh, one of the interesting things about loneliness is that was like a that was a problem prior to sin. Um, in a in a pre-fallen world, it was not good that man was alone. I mean, it's like, well, why not? It's because we're not meant to be isolated. Because we're made in the image of a trinitarian God who is community within Himself. And so, um, in a in a good creation created by God, unaffected by sin, there was a situation where it's like this isn't right or this isn't good. This has to. There needs to be a complement. To this, and so when John talked about loneliness as a fundamental reality of hell, that isolation of the self, I think he was, uh, I think he's, he's spot on. And that's not to say for all the introverts in the room, um, solitude's okay. <laughs> um, I need, I need solitude to regenerate, uh, to just get re-energized. And I, uh, if if I start to fade, it's because I've been around too many wonderful people, and uh, <laughs> too too much time. But. Um, uh, so solitude's good. In fact, Dallas Willard says that it's in solitude that you find out that you're not alone. Um, and so I wouldn't equate solitude and, and loneliness. But when, when John was talking about that, if you've not read C.S. Lewis's The Problem of Pain, um, there's a chapter in there that he writes on the topic of hell. And, the to and that chapter alone is worth the price of the book. And I wanted to read just a little bit um, from, I want to read a couple quotes from that chapter because he's talking about this reality of hell as this isolated um, individual being and what happens when we fall back in on ourselves. Here's a couple of things that he says about that reality. He says, the characteristic of lost souls is their rejection of everything that is not simply themselves. Right? Their rejection of everything that is not simply themselves. That's, that's the characteristic of lost souls. He goes on to talk about um, in the world where that God has created, we have a capacity um, to enjoy the good. But that capacity comes through our bodies. Um, we, we have contact with what he calls the outer world, and that's our capacity for um, experiencing good. However, he says death removes that last contact. And he says this, the egoist, and that's this person that's centered on themselves, the egoist after death has his wish to lie wholly in the self and to make the best of what he finds there. And what he finds there is hell. To be a complete man means to have the passions obedient to the will and the will offered to God. Part of the point I'm trying to make is that our freedom is not throwing off every restraint and just being unrestrained. This having your will under God's authority is important. To be a complete man means to have the passions obedient to the will and the will offered to God. To have been a man, he says it's an ex-man or uh, a damned ghost, would presumably mean to consist of a will utterly centered in itself and passions utterly uncontrolled by the will. In other words, you're, you have fallen back on you and there's really nothing of substance there. He, this is the, and this is the one I wanted to, that came to mind when John was sharing. This is a very, uh, C, this is typical C.S. Lewis. He says, I willingly believe that the damned are, in one sense, successful. They're rebels to the end. But the doors of hell are locked on the inside. 
Now listen to this. He says, they enjoy forever the horrible freedom they have demanded and are therefore self-enslaved. Just as the blessed, forever submitting to obedience, become through all eternity more and more free. Who knew that your freedom comes through submission in obedience to God? That sounds counterintuitive that I, I would be free by submission, but this works in almost every other area of life without, without issue. If you want to master a skill, you have to submit yourself to instruction in structure, sometimes very rigid structure. You think about these people who play instruments proficiently. There is a structure and an order to all of reality that you have to that you have to be fully submitted to in order to be completely free on that instrument, sports, trades, whatever it is. So it, it's not it's it, this isn't a foreign concept, freedom through submission. But sometimes when it's like, well, but I want to do what I want to do, and, and there might not be any more lost person than, than the person who's quote unquote free to do exactly as they want. That's that self getting back. Um, in on itself and finding like I'm gonna do the best with what I can when I find this and it's like oh Lewis says well what you're gonna find there is him so it turns out that our freedom doesn't lie in casting aside every restraint and I love this quote from GK Chesterton and there's a lot of people in his time going in another direction but he says this he said um, the more I considered Christianity the more I found that while it had established a rule and order, in other words, I might have to submit myself in obedience to some things. Um, the more I found that while it had established a rule and order, the chief aim of that order was to give room for good things to run wild. And I love that. You put these boundaries in place and it's like within this, you were completely free. And this is good, but you, there has to be this submission there. So. Um, yeah, it had established a rule in order. The chief aim of that order was to give room for good things to run wild. I love that. I was thinking about Psalm 1. Um, Psalm 1 in verse 2 it talks about this blessed man. But uh, it says in verse 2, his, uh, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. If you're seeking freedom, would you run to the law and just meditate on it day and night? The, well, the law restrains me. Well, no, God's law is a freeing sort of thing. Uh, submit yourself to these things, yes. But when you do that, you'll find, I think, your freedom. Psalm 119. I'm not going to read the whole thing. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. I know. Listen, that would, not, that, would be time, that would be time worthwhile. Um, you go through Psalm 119, it's the law, it's precepts, it's commands. But it, there's a joy and a freedom that comes through the meditation of these things. Um, I, when you just go there, you'll, it's like pick a verse. It probably applies to what we're talking about. Verse 98, your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have far more insight than all my teachers. Your testimonies are my meditation. Um, verse 97, oh, I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Well, why? Well, because it's freeing the psalmist to be everything that God created him to be by submission to that law. Um, Proverbs. I was thinking about Proverbs 3, but then when you go backwards and forwards, it's all over the place. Um, submit to this instruction. And in submission to this instruction, you'll find your life. If you go away from this, actually that's the way of suffering and of death. Um, I think this freedom through submission thing is hugely um, important Deuteronomy. If you go to Deuteronomy 6, I have to read a couple of verses out of there. Um, start in verse 5. Deuteronomy 6, I'll start in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and, shall, and uh, shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. What is he teaching them? He's teaching them God's law. 
wouldn't read a law book, typically, <laughs> especially if I was looking for freedom. Um, and yet, when you have a good God who's telling you how things are and how to operate there, uh, that is your life. Verse 24 and 25 at the end of this chapter. So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival as it is today. So there it is. He's giving his law to Israel here in order that they may live. Verse 25, it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all the commandment before the Lord our God, just as he commands us. Uh, how important is obedience to our freedom? It's the most popular verse in the Bible when it comes to freedom. It's horribly abused. The truth shall set you free, right? <laughs> Let's take a look at that. John 8, it's a true statement. It just really mattered. The context really matters. John 8, uh, starting in verse 31, remember the rules not to ever read a Bible verse, that read a little bit before and after, but um, John 8, 31, Jesus is talking to the Jews who had believed in him, and he says this, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. Are you free? You're completely free? Well, now you're submitting to the teacher, right? If you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been enslaved to anyone. I'm an American. How is it that you say you will become free? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. Do what you want, you'll find that you're enslaved to something. And if it's not to God, that's it's going to be an abusive situation. Even if that thing is me, I, I'm not going to handle myself very well. Um, sin is, this, is the chain that enslaves us to idols. And most idols are not bad in and of themselves, but they were never meant to have that control. So you, you're going to be enslaved to that which you worship. You worship a good God, you're going to find your freedom. You worship anything else that's not meant to have that, Slaves of sin. John 14, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And there's the obedience. I love Jesus. So I'm going to do what he says. Even when I don't like it. What are his commandments, by the way? What's that? To believe on him, yes. What was that? That's the one I have. Yeah. I'm giving you a new commandment. This is John 13. That you love one another just as I have loved you. It's a powerful statement. It's okay to say, well, I love somebody. But to love them like Jesus loved them? He went to a Roman cross, right? If we love each other like that, am I going to be free? If I'm being loved like that, that sounds free. If I, but I have to extend it as well. This is where Mary Ellen went the Lord was speaking through you is connected to this, I think, is this one anothering, um, which I think is a Marleyism. Is it one anothering a verb in, your, in the Hicken household? Yeah. Yeah, one anothering. Um, can't do this thing alone. Not meant to do this thing alone because we're image bearers of God. We, we love Him. We'll keep His commandments. Love God. Love each other. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. That is a powerful powerful witness. And so we look at Jesus as the model of freedom, as a guy completely submitted to God, completely loving other people. And it's like that's the image that we are to be ever more conformed to. When I was thinking about freedom, uh, 2 Corinthians 3.17 comes to mind. This is probably another one that if you cherry pick it, it, it might sound better than it is. Um, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Um, there's a context there for that part of it, and this is according to the lexicon. The freedom being talked about is from Jewish errors that are so blinding the mental vision that it does not discern the majesty of Christ. Where he talks about there's this veil that's, that's over the eyes when you read the, the law and, and you're unable to see the majesty 
of Christ, but it, it seems to me that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there really is freedom in any context. Um, if, he, if He's in our midst, uh, there's going to be freedom there. Which led me to Matthew 18, 20. What is Matthew 18, 20? Where two or three are gathered together. Jesus says, I am there in their midst. Well, how is He in our midst? Well, it's through His Spirit, right? Well, if where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, then where two or three are gathered together doing the one anothering thing, there might be freedom there. And I think we cannot underestimate that. So this is my conclusion. We're already there. Hebrews 10. Uh, let's consider now, I think this is 24 and 25. Let's consider how to encourage one another in love and good deeds. Not abandoning our own meeting together, as is the habit of some people, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Um, I don't think it's, I think you could argue it's never been more critical for us to be in fellowship together, one another. Um, when we're doing that, the Spirit of the Lord's there. If the two or three are gathered, I'm there in your midst. There's freedom there. But you have to be obedient to Christ. Because that's when truth sets you free. But they'll, they'll know you're my disciples if we do what? If we actually obey what Jesus says and we, and we love one another. And I think um, Mary Ellen alluded to, I, I think it doesn't, the world's broken. And it's getting broken in wacky ways. And, and your work, who knows what kind of people might be coming into a church and what kind of history may have led them to this place. And it's like, when that happens, want to be the kind of people who are reflecting Jesus well together where it's like, you know what? Yes, there's deep brokenness here. But it's not beyond the love of God. And it's, and it's not beyond um, significant healing, even in this life, through Jesus and his spirit. And I think that's where some will find their freedom. Um, and yet, Mary Ellen, what I loved about your testimony, I don't think you used the word obedience. And you'd probably say it was... <laughs> Um, spotty at times, but like I'm hearing in your testimony, that's, the truth does set us free. And sometimes I just have to be obedient even when I don't like it. And it's like I have to make this decision because I know it's the right thing, even though everything in me kicks against it. And, and I think we really ought to buckle down and at some point, this stuff's not that complicated. We can be obedient to Christ. Well, how do I be obedient to Christ? Well, try loving somebody. How do I love them? I don't know. Serve them in some way. Ask them how they're doing. Um, now that will require some appropriate level of transparency among each other, but if that's, um, that's where the Lord's heart is for us, I'd like to see us buckle down and do that ever more as these days approach. And I, I'm praying that when broken people, when the Lord draws broken people in, and it might be as some of them say, it's like I... He who I did not want to meet met me. Um, these kind of people come and it's like, oh, this is freedom. This is love. This is what I was made for. It would be a very special thing. So I'd like to encourage us as we go forth from here, let's continue in obedience and steadfastness in the things that we know to be true. Uh, and let's continue to commit to our meeting together, not Sunday morning meeting, but yes, Sunday morning meeting but doing the one anothering thing. And let's not underestimate what our interactions in this love between us will testify to a very broken world. Let's, let's pray. Yes, go ahead. I'll say it really loud because I'm not going to walk up That's again. Right. But I just want to say that somebody caught me in the bathroom and with tears, you know, it's like I had no idea what you were going through. Well, I just want to say that we all can't minister to every burden of the church. God will lead and guide, and if we're sensitive and we notice, like Aaron and her did, they noticed what Moses needed, they noticed his weight. We just need to have our antennas up and our discernment, and the Holy Spirit will guide us. I didn't need 200 people to all minister you. Yes. So, but God sent the right ones, whether you were behind the scenes praying or whatever. So please don't be condemned by anything I said. The Lord will lead you. Just be open. That's all. And so, yeah. No, and that's a good word because we have Messiah complexes. I should have known it. I could have really helped. Well, yeah, yeah. maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs>
it's a free up. He's the savior, he's the, he's the adequate one. The rest of us will play our part as he leads us. Um, Father, we, we wanna be about everything that our Father is about, just as Jesus was about his Father's business. And um, Lord, I just pray that as we move forth from here, that you'll bring us deeper into obedience to you, which is a deeper experience of our freedom. Uh, as we continue to be conformed more and more into your image, which is what you've designed us to be in the first place. So we just pray, Lord, uh, blessing over this church, over this town. Father, prepare us for whatever lies ahead, whatever your heart for us is moving forward. We want to be prepared in all about those things. We thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we are dismissed, and we'd appreciate help with uh, getting these chairs up if you're able to.